Hello and welcome to the Press Box. Joining me today on the sofa is our non-league core experts Luke Breedwell and Matt Riggs, as well as the usual suspects Ed Sires and Ben Sprout. You might be wondering why I'm here and not over in non-league corner, but how could we start this week's show without the FA Cup? Yes, and what a weekend it's been for Blythe Spartans and for Gateshead, both advancing into the third round for what is Blythe's fourth appearance at this stage of the competition, and Gateshead it's their first time in 60 years that they've reached this prestigious third round. It was, however, the Spartans who took the limelight from this round of FA Cup fixtures. Under the Friday night lights of Victoria Park, in front of the BBC cameras, they came from behind to beat Hartlepool United, who were 65 places above them. Matt, we were there, and it was full of drama right to the death, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a great night at uh, Victoria Park, and that Jarrett Rivers goal in the, in the 89th or 90th minute. It was a great way to win it and you just saw from the scenes at the end with all the supporters and all the substitutes, the managers, all the staff, everyone came running on the field and it was just a really great night for Blythe Spartans. And it was a tough first half, Hartlepool had plenty of chances, obviously went one nil up, but Blythe arguably the better side in that second half despite playing a side 65 places above them. Yeah, I think so. I mean, as you say, the first half was really tough for them, but uh, to go into half time with just one goal down, I think was a really big positive for them. You know, they could have could have conceded two or three in that first half, but uh, to, to stay in the tie and to stay in the, the match at half-time was really good uh, for Spartans and Tom Wade. And, uh, you know, words were obviously said at half-time that got them really up for the second half, and they went out there and, and just seemed to fight straight from the off. They got that goal with Stephen Turnbull and uh, obviously kept fighting right to the last and, and got the result in the end. Do you think they showed more desire than, than the Hartlepool squad to keep going to the end? Well, I think, obviously, both teams, it's a massive massive uh, thing to get through to the third round of the FA Cup so even if you're a League Two side you know you're going to want to do that and try and draw a big Premiership side um, but as it was I think we've seen from Blythe they played already played six or seven seven or eight maybe uh, FA Cup games this season so I think uh, their desire to get that far and to get to the second round really did show as you say in the second round and um, you know everyone was just fighting for each other everyone was working hard and, uh, and, you know, it told in the end. Yeah, and it was a frenetic finish and we caught up with manager Tom Wade and Stephen Turnbull after the final whistle. It was a great occasion after the support as well. Outstanding from start to finish. And we just tried as a proper game and we tried our best and we worked hard. And Yeah, fair enough, they, they probably were the better side on the day, but it's about scoring goals and about winning games, you know. I said to the lads at half-time, I said, if we can stay in this game, nick a goal. Because to be fair, they were on top of it. If we can nick a goal, we stand every chance and we uh, nicked that goal and then we went on to win, so happy days. As soon as it left your boot, did you know it was heading for that top corner? Do you know what? Before I even hit it, when I was stood there, I thought, you know what, this is going to go in. You get them feelings sometimes and I got that feel and I hit it sweetly and I didn't even see it go in. I just heard everyone cheering, you know what I mean? It's just like a blank in my mind, but it went in and I couldn't have been any happier. Stronger side second half, to be honest with you. I thought fitness levels were strong. They were just launching the ball up front for, for the big lad, uh, but I, I thought we were the... Were the Better side second half. I thought we were fitter side second half, which is a, which is a bit of a, a statement. Um, we're trying to get as much as we can up the midfield three. Uh, we knew they would they would blow up at one time, but I thought they were superb and the lads came on were great. So I always thought we had a chance because we're getting stronger and stronger, and they were just falling off, you know. And we can see there from Tom Wade's words after the game how much that victory really meant to him, Matt. Yeah, I mean he's a he's a blind lad himself, Tom Wade, and uh, he was on the terraces, you know, in the, that cut run of the 70s for Blyd. So. You know, it means a great deal to him. He knows the history of the club, knows the, the FA Cup history that they've got there. And uh, so it was a massive day for him. It was his 100th game in charge at Victoria Park as well. And uh, I think he and the staff deserve a lot of credit because, you know, they've got a young squad down up there in Blythe. But uh, to mould them into a side that is beating teams in the Football League is incredible. And to get to the third round is a massive achievement for him and, and the club. Definitely. And the cameras were there. Were you impressed with the football and ability of Blythe, lads? I think it was fantastic, and what impressed me the most, I think, about Blythe was the uh, the fitness that they showed. I think normally when you see an non-league team playing against league opposition, it's quite you kind of expect them to kind of come out the blocks quite quickly and then kind of die down a bit as fitness levels drop. Um, for Blythe, they showed quite good resilience. It was almost the other way around. I think they started a bit slowly, one 0 down at half time, um, but a one 0 you're always in the game. And I think by the end of the match, I think it was clearly Blythe that wanted it more, and I think that showed. I, I'd go along with that. I think. First half, Hartlepool posed some problems. You know, they, as they were saying on the coverage, it was almost surprising that Hartlepool was low down in the league as they worked through it. As much as they were playing, aside from a few divisions below, they were playing some really nice football around the edge of the area. Marlon Harewood was central to that, but after after half time, Blythe really took the game by the scruff of the neck and fully deserved the win by the end of the match. 
Definitely, and has the BBC's live coverage brought some of the magic back to the FA Cup that has been missing in recent years? I think it has. I think I, ITV it was almost a case of they, they weren't, as much as they were showing kind of the non-league games, you perhaps wouldn't have seen what we saw with Alan Shearer going into the dressing room with them stood on the pitch and that type of thing. And by getting the likes of Shearer in, you know, for a northeast tie where the players were obviously, they were delighted they was there, you know, Turnbull saying it was a dream to score in front of Shearer. Whereas ITV may have perhaps dragged out the usual old pundits, like regardless of who was playing, to be honest. Yeah, and for Hartlepool, it, w it was great for them because there's not going to be many opportunities for them to be on TV either. Yeah, it's disappointing for them as well. I think the manager got sacked after the game and they've had a really poor season. I think they really could have used this uh, a cup run as a bit of a catalyst to kind of get back on track. So I think it's a missed opportunity for them. But yeah, as you say, I think for League Two side, they don't get on terrestrial television very often. I think it'll be great for them. We'll talk about Blythe's next round opponents shortly, but meanwhile, Gateshead's progression was a little bit less dramatic. They ended Warrington's FA Cup dream on Sunday again in front of the cameras as BT Sport took coverage of the All Man League tie. It did take them until the last minute to fully wrap up the 2 0 victory, but it was never really in doubt, was it? No, I think uh, obviously they scored in the early on in the first 10 minutes, and uh, you know they really came out of the blocks and it settled the nerves because I think. You know, for a game, for a conference side, being on BT Sport, being live on TV, although they're playing a team in a few divisions below them, they're going to be nervous as well. It's on, it's on national TV. So I think uh, that would have settled the nerves. And from then on, I think they, it was pretty comfortable for them. Warrington had a couple of chances to, to get back into the game. But, uh, you know, Gates said that we're always in control. And uh, d then Danny Wright wrapped it up uh, in stoppage time. So they got through pretty comfortably in the end. And you can see from Gary Mill's reaction to both the goals what it means to him and also to the club as well. Yeah, and it's huge. Obviously, it's been 60 years since uh, this stage of the uh, FA Cup last time in the third round. So for Gary Mills, as you say, for the chairman, for the supporters, uh, they'll all be buzzing. And uh, hopefully it'll kickstart a bit of a, bit of a better uh, form, patch of form in the league as well because they have been struggling of late. So, uh, you know, hopefully it goes hand in hand we're getting to the third round of the Cup. And thanks to the amazing story that is the FA Cup, we now have four tiny and weird clubs in the third round and our non-league sides are both drawn teams with incredible pedigree. Blythe play host to two-time FA Cup runners up Birmingham City and Gateshead travel to the West Midlands to face Premier League side West Bromwich Albion. For our professional teams, Sunderland host a rematch of their 1973 Cup triumph against Leeds United, while Newcastle have a less glamorous tie away to Leicester City. All in all, lads, we have some fantastic ties there for our clubs, don't we? Yeah, I think, um, I think Newcastle have probably got the worst one in that draw. I think no one likes an all-Premier League tie uh, in the FA Cup third round. So I think Leeds against Sunderland's got some uh, good history as well. I think everyone immediately remembered that 1973 Cup final, probably the finest memory in Sunderland's history. Um, it's not going to be quite as glamorous as that, unfortunately. The FA Cup doesn't quite have the spark that it used to back in the 70s. But um, yeah, I think it'll be great for the fans, I think, to relive that memory. I think for all four sides, as much as uh, Gateshead and Blythe have drawn, like, teams from the top two divisions, I've, I still feel like none of the four sides have drawn games where they'll think they haven't got a chance. I think West Brom are struggling in the league, Gateshead are, Gateshead are a decent side, I think if they pick their form up they can go there and give them a decent game. Blyther at home to a Birmingham side, the, the last couple of seasons have really struggled. I think Newcastle as much as it's a, it's a all Premier League tie, Leicester are bottom of the league, you know, they've got to hope that in pick up result there, they've improved in the Cups this season, even if the FA Cup record isn't great under Pardew. There will be a worry that last season they played Cardiff at this stage, you were really struggling and Cardiff beat them. But um, And Sunderland, will, they've got a bit of a knack of getting the home Cup draws and they'll be happy again with that. And it's that old cliche again, but nobody will fancy coming to a Pat Croft Park, will they, Matt? No, certainly not. I think, you know, despite whoever they got, even if it was a top 10 Premiership side, at Croft Park, you know, all the players have been saying that, you know, they're welcome that because no one will fancy it. You know, Stephen Turnbull said in one of the interviews we did with him, he'd like to see someone like David Silver come up and play at Croft Park. And, uh, you know, I think Birmingham will go there and, and won't be that confident about getting a result, you know. So uh, it's going to be packed out day there and um, it's a potential tie for TV possibly, we'll see uh, in the coming days. So uh, I think it'll be a really good tie for them. And, well, congratulations and good luck, as always, to all those sides. But away from the romance of the FA Cup, it was supposed to be business as usual for Chelsea against a Newcastle side plagued with injuries. Only this wasn't the case after a spirited performance from the Magpies brought Mourinho's men back down to earth with a bang. It was a well-deserved win, wasn't it, Ben? I think it was. It was a fantastic performance, you know, from front to back. I think everyone played a role. 
Uh, it was slightly different to how Sunderland played it last week, and I think that might be why Newcastle took the point. So I think they pressed higher than Sunderland did. They didn't really. They sat deep later on, but Sunderland were doing that from the off, and I think that was crucial. Jack Colback led the charge with some great pressing. Paul Dummett was brilliant. Ayosi Perez worked hard, and uh, Moose Sissoko really exploited uh, the one weakness in Chelsea's defence, which is their pace, and he was able to run at them, run beyond them, in a similar fashion to how Conor Wickham had a bit of luck against them last week, just kind of exposing the, you know, an age in John Terry and Gary Cale's not blessed with a huge amount of speed. How big of an impact was it having Colaccini back in the side? I think that was huge. He was, he was absolutely sublime, to be honest. He was playing against Diego Costa, who's quicker than him, he's stronger than him, and didn't give him a sniff all afternoon. He, sh he really showed the, how important experience is at this level. You know, he's just positioned himself so well, didn't give the ball away. And you can spend 32 million on a player like Mangala at Man City, he was a good athlete, a good footballer, but until you've got that kind of experience, you, you're not going to be able to handle the better players sometimes. But you look at the Mourinho's excuses for the defeat, and you also see that Sunderland, obviously, they haven't had the best of times up in the North East. Has he just got to admit defeat tactically? I mean, Gus Poirier got it right and they didn't concede and Newcastle have gone out and scored two. I think, well, he's, he's moaning about the ball boys. I've been moaning about the ball boys at St James's Park for years. I think <laughs> if he thinks there's some kind of ploy there that meant him losing the game, I think he's getting a bit paranoid. It was, it's just, it's a ridiculous excuse, really. And he was, com last week he complimented Sunderland on defending and said there's no crime to defend. And this week he's saying there's only one team looking to win. And he, it's basically, I think he got a point at Sunderland that he was fairly happy with, and he's not happy at losing at St James's. So. I think his comments against Sunderland as well, when he said we were very good defensively, I think that was all a bit tongue in cheek, to be honest. Um, I mean, teams always come up against Chelsea and defend, they're used to it. It's only, after, it's only when they fail to get the win that they always uh, seem to find a fault in it. And it's Arsenal away next up for Newcastle. How do you think they'll get on there? I don't think they've failed to have one eye on next week, to be honest. You know, they've got a cup court final against Tottenham and the derby with Sunderland. It's probably the biggest week that Newcastle have had since they played Benfica in Sunderland a couple of years ago and that ended in a 3-0 derby defeat. But um, they've got Jack Anik in goal, who, you know, he made a good debut, but it's, it's going to be a struggle against one of them. Another of the top teams, no Steven Taylor suspended, Moose Sissoko suspended. Arsenal aren't in the best place at the minute and you might fancy him to get something but with those injury struggles and suspensions it's going to be difficult. And you mentioned that Jack Hannock is uh, going to come in again for the next game. Is there no chance of them bringing in a keeper on emergency loan? It doesn't look like it. I think Newcastle, they had a bit of a mess with their, their loan deals in the summer. You know, they loaned a lot of players out and not put uh, recall clauses in them and Carl Darlow is one of them. And it would appear the Premier League are now su suggesting that's why they have no excuse for bringing in another goalkeeper. So they, they might have done better there. There's a great chance though for the young lad to you know get his experience and you know what he pulls off a few good saves, has a good game. The sky's uh, limit for him. I think he looked like he was really enjoying it on Saturday. You know, it's almost like Tim Krull in Palermo again. He was, you know, he was getting bullied around a bit by uh, Didier Drogba and John Terry, but he was you know laughing it off, ignoring them. He wasn't going to be rushed by them, and it just looked like he was really making the most of a chance that he probably wasn't expecting to be getting. While Newcastle triumphed, Sunderland could only manage a point away at Anfield in a goalless draw. Was it a point gained or two dropped against a hit and miss Liverpool side? Yeah, I think any point at Anfield these days is a good point. Um, I think even though Liverpool haven't maybe had the best season so far, um, I think it was good for Sunderland to kind of show a bit more st defensive stability after the Manchester City game where they were perhaps a bit weak at the back. Um, Wes Brown missed the Man City game in midweek and I think that showed, I think Sebastian Quartes came in. Uh, he didn't quite have the understanding he had with John O'Shea um, that Wes Brown and John O'Shea often share. And Wes Brown came back in against Liverpool and I think they looked like more of a defensive unit. Uh, I know Quartes hasn't had a lot of, uh, a lot of like, time with the Sun and players, he's had a lot of injuries so far this year and obviously he was ineligible against Liverpool being his parent club. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, keeping that same back five helped a lot for Sunderland at the weekend. Is that a worry for someone going forward? Obviously, Brown and O'Shea aren't any spring chickens anymore. There's a good chance every couple of weeks one of them's going to be out through one means or another. And you know, as, you, as you've said, Coates came in and didn't impress. Is that something they're going to look to sort of reinforce in that position in January transfer window? Um, I certainly hope so. I think it's definitely a concern for Sunderland. I think Santiago Virginia's natural positions are centre back, but every time he plays there, he seems to make a mistake, and he looks a lot more competent on the right hand side. Uh, so that only leaves Sebastian Quartes in terms of backup for, uh, for O'Shea and Brown. And I think he's, as I said, he's been bogged down with injuries and he just hasn't had the chance to kind of assert himself 
uh, in the team. So at the minute, it is looking like two two players for that for those two roles. And so I think that's got to be high on the priority list for Gus Poyet uh, in January. Uh, we talk about the importance of uh, perhaps getting another centre back in, but I think that's perhaps something for the future. I think at the moment, kind of the problem is attacking. Really, you know, they've, they've scored one in two games against tough sides, but. It's another case of them drawing games. You, you, there's a point at Anfield's good, but when you've already drawn seven or eight games this season, it perhaps doesn't look as good. And they need more attacking threat going forward. I think you look at that and you say Fletcher will put the chance away if you make them for him, but it's not really happening at the moment, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I mean for me in the, in the Man City game, obviously we saw the, the class of Aguero and others going forward for them. But, uh, you know, at the back they had Boyata playing, you know, a bit, a bit of an experience there. They cliche at left back, who the jury's been out for him for me over the last season or two. Uh, so I, d I just didn't really see Sunderland going at them too much. You know, Fletcher was pretty isolated. Wickham was bright for them, but you know, I would have liked to see Buckley get involved more. And uh, you know, there just wasn't that much of a threat for a, for a Manchester City back four that you know could have been exposed. And Conor Wickham that we've talked about a lot in this program. You know, whether it's working, whether it's not, uh, he seems to have a really good game and then quite a poor game. What are your thoughts on him and his position on the left? Well, I mean, it's an interesting one. I mean, he is a striker, and he, he, for a long time this season he's played on the left, but he's just been playing like almost as a striker, and he just hasn't worked. I think recently he's kind of tried to adapt more to that role. He's started coming inside to support for Team Fletcher a bit more. Against Manchester City and against Chelsea, I think I saw him uh, track back a little bit more as well, which is a positive as well. Um, but, I mean, he's got a long way to go to kind of assert his like, authority over that role, and I think he himself will see himself as a striker in the future. But it is great news, of course, that we've just heard he has signed a new contract coming up towards the January transfer window. He is a big player still, you know, he's playing every game, week in, week out. How important is it that someone has secured him? I think it is important, but I think the figures going around about 60 grand a week, I think, is the, uh, the rumour that he's on now. And I think that's a bit over the top. He becomes Sunderland's top, uh, top earner now. He overtakes Adam Johnson. For a 21-year-old lad, that's, uh, that's a lot of faith that the club has shown in him. Um, and he maybe hasn't, he's been a first-team regular for around about a year now, and I think he hasn't really... Uh, deserved it, to be honest. I think he needs a lot more time to be kind of shown that faith by the club. Do I think it shows ambition that we're tying down long-term contracts? Perhaps, but it also shows a bit of um, bit of nerves, I think, from Sunderland. I think after the callback saga in, uh, last summer, I think there was a lot of worry that we might lose another one. Lose uh, Connor Wickham was a big investment when he came over from Ipswich, and uh, I think it would have been quite embarrassing for the club if, as soon as he establishes himself in the side, then he goes off on a free transfer. I think fifty uh, five hundred thousand pounds he would have gone for in compensation. Which is nothing compared to what we paid for. I think I think that's right. W Wickham, like Colback, was another one that's actually been linked with Newcastle, and we saw Sunderland's reaction to losing, like Ed said, losing Colback to Newcastle, and I can't. That was someone who came through for free as much as they put a lot of time into him. Connor Wickham cost a lot of money, and to see him go for free to, as Ed said, just as he's developing to go to their nearest rivals, that would be disastrous, really. But so you're saying it's more of a, a panic contract, really? Well, I hope not, but I mean, I wouldn't surprise me with Sunderland. I think they were caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, Conor Wickham's a player that he sees himself as being a big player in the future. I certainly see a lot of potential in him. I wouldn't have blamed him for going to the club and saying, look, I want a big contract if I'm going to stay here because I'm going to have a lot of clubs that are potentially going to be after me. And on the other hand, Sunderland is saying, well, maybe you don't deserve 60 grand a week, but we can't afford to lose you. So there's a, there's a rock and a hard place situation going on there, I think. And just looking ahead to next week, West Ham are obviously flying in the league under uh, Sam Allardyce this season. Can you really expect anything from that game? I think Sunderland will see that as a winnable game, to be honest. I think, as I've spoken a lot about how they've become a difficult side to beat, and I think Poyet's building a bit of a reputation for that at the minute. Um, another draw would be a bit of a frustration for Sunderland. Obviously, they've had a lot of draws this year. Um, but I say they're difficult to beat. I think they've got points against Tottenham this season, Man United, Chelsea and Liverpool, amongst others. So, um, I mean, West Ham offline, as you say, but I mean, they're a side that some will want to emulate in terms of their ability to kind of push on and go for a top half finish. And in that sense, I think they'll see it as a winnable game. But we saw what happened at Southampton and West Ham in recent years has been a game that you look at Sunderland and you think there are three points that could be won, but given their position and their form, could we be sceptical? Well, I think you look at West Ham a year or two ago, and I think a lot of fans were calling for Aldice to be sacked, their football was poor and they are on, they're suddenly third in the league and flying. And I think that just shows in football how quickly things can change. And I think Sunderland, from the players to the management, to the board, to the fans, I think they'll all kind of be able to look at West Ham and say, you know what, we aren't far away from being a side like West Ham. So I think in that sense, yeah, I think there's absolutely every chance that we can go and beat them. I think, it, like you said, it's probably a team that Sunderland do want to emulate. And I think the transfer window that West Ham have had this summer 
is probably what Sunderland need. You know, they've gone out and they've bought Valencia and Sacco. They've got Andy Carroll back and seen them against Swansea at the weekend. They looked really, really dangerous. And Andy Carroll's come up and scored against Sunderland before while he's been at West Ham. And he's probably not, he was the last player that a lot of centre backs want to be facing. And when he's just one of a number of options, it, it makes it a tough game for Sunderland. But it's also, it shows how far West Ham have come really to have that kind of threat. And that's not all for this week's action. As usual, we have highlights from Jow Rufin and North Shields. James Cartwright talks us through the action. North Shields progressed to the fourth round of the FA Vars with a 4-2 win at CM. Ben Richardson put the visitors ahead after 20 minutes. Shields doubled their lead minutes into the second half when the informed Gareth Bainbridge tapped in Adam Forster's cross. Gareth Bainbridge added his second with 25 minutes to play, firing past keeper Sean Newbrook to make it 3-0 to North Shields. See him a flying in the league and threatened to come back when Liam McBride turned the ball home to make it 3-1 minutes later. The home side continued to push forward and won a penalty with 10 minutes to play, Adam Johnston sending the keeper the wrong way to set up a nervy finish. But North Shields put the game beyond doubt when Ben Richardson scored his second with a free kick to make it 4-2. Seymour reduced to nine men late on. Lewis Wing received red shortly before Darren Weir was sent off for this late challenge. North Shields will face Northern League opposition in the fourth round with a home tie against Concert. Jarrell Rufin travelled to Durham City in the Evac Northern League looking to make it four wins from four. Malcolm Orion has scored numerous goals this season, but he'd be hard pressed to find a better strike than this, which put the Rufin 1 0 up on 16 minutes. They made it 2 in the second half, Lewis Teasdale rising highs to head home from the corner from the left. The roof has made the point safe when Anthony Myers raced through to fire past the Durham City goalkeeper. The win moves Jarrell Rufin up to fourth in the back Northern League. Next up, Dunstan at home. Both teams are flying, the Rufin unbeaten seven, North Shields roll on in the Vars, and can they go all the way, Matt? I think so. I mean, uh, they've drawn concert in the next round, and uh, you know, them being in the same league as them, but uh, further down the table, it's a winnable game for them. And, you know, they got that man, Gareth Brainbridge, we talked about him before. He's a proven goal scorer and he'll be a key man in, in that run if they are to get to Wembley. And another team who were in the FA Vars action was Whitley Bay, who have a rich history in this competition. Sean McCormick visited Hillheads ahead of their third round clash with Dunstan. It's FA Vars' third round day here at David Hillheads in a competition that has shared along with a fair the North East non league clubs. Five out of the last six winners have come from the region, but none have been more successful than today's host, Whitley Bay. Legendary manager Ian Chandler stepped down in February and was replaced by former player Leon Ryan. Ryan himself certainly knows what it takes to win the FA Vars, having won it twice as a player at Whitley Bay and at Spennymoor. And with Bay languishing at 11th from the Northern League Division 1, then the FA Vars represents a realistic opportunity for silverware this season. Dunton UTS are currently riding high in the Northern League Division 1 in 4th place and have already beaten Whitley Bay this season. However, Bay themselves coming at the game under some good form, having won their last four games, scoring 19 goals in the process. Before they'll be thrown out the window, as both sides look to add to their illustrious history in the FA Vars. Commentary comes from Sean McCormick. Gary Ormston. Oh, it hasn't been dealt with, it's a chance with Dunstan! And it's 1 0! Dunstan's here the lead! And it's the right back, Stephen Harrison! Confused at the back there for Whitley Bay, and Dunstan capitalise! Stephen Harrison. Searches for the back post. It's got up well there, Coulson. Dixon. Gary Ormston. Ups into space, and Coulson with the effort! And it's in! What a finish there from the centre half, David Coulson! And it's 2 0 at Dunstan! Whitley Bay looks shell shocked! Breaks on Kempster now for Whitley Bay. Hardy Kempster. Peter Watlin. Try to force somebody goes down, it's a penalty! Peter Watlin wins a penalty with Willie Bay! Paul Chow. Puts it away emphatically! Willie Bay back in the game! Paul Chow 
who scored all three of Ivar's finals. Puts it in the top left hand corner, fantastic penalty. They win the throwing back, but that's it, it's full time. Dunstan have won at Hillhouse today. So it's been a miserable day for Whitley Bay on North Tyneside. Their dream of a fifth of Ivar's title is now over and their attention will now switch to Northern League Division 1 clash with North Shields on Tuesday in a North Tyneside derby. But for Dunstan, their dreams of clearing a second FA Vars title after their win in 2012 are very much still alive and they'll have one eye on their fourth round draw. I've been Sean McCormick for the Press Box. A big thanks for Luke and Matt for joining myself, Ed and Ben this week, but now it's time for the quiz, FA Cup style. Before we start the quiz, we're going to have North East Player of the Week award. And that this week is going to Jarrett Rivers of Blythe Spartans for his fantastic performance and late goal against Hartlepool in the FA Cup second round. So well done, Jarrett. But now, we're back to the quiz. Joining me on my right-hand side, we have the legendary Jack Spedding and Ed Sires. And on the Newcastle United team, we have Sean McCormick and Ben Spratt. So to start proceedings, we have an FA Cup themed quiz. So fingers on buzzers, everybody. The rules are simple. Buzz in if you know the answer. And then we'll top the scores up at the end. Question number one. Who scored the winning goal in last season's FA Cup final? Going to have to go to my right, to Sunderland. Aaron Ramsey. Aaron Ramsey is the correct answer. Stolen there. <laughs> On to question two now. Which two teams will have a replay to face Manchester United? Newcastle. Yeovil and Accrington. That is correct. Yeovil and Accrington is the right answer. Name a team outside of London and Manchester to have won the FA Cup since 2000. Liverpool. Correct. You could have also had Portsmouth or Wigan Athletic. Next question. Who were the last non-league side to knock out Premier League opposition? <sighs> Luton against Norwich. <sighs> Luton against Norwich is the correct answer. Well done. Great bit of trivia. Great bit of trivia. Quite a top little question, this. Who knocked Blythe out of the FA Cup in, the, in 2009? Blackburn Rovers. Blackburn Rovers is correct. Well done. Knocked them out of the third round in 2009. <laughs> Who did Gateshead beat in the first two rounds of this year's FA Cup? Newcastle. I need both um, teams. First two, like, proper rounds. Right, first come on. Round five, um, four, three, and two. Um, it's gone. Gordon. We're going to have to move it over. We're going to have to move it over. To Sunderland, Sunderland. Warrington. And Warrington. And Norton. How did you get that point? Just, just psychic. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Just amazing. Unlucky Sean, you were just out of time. You were just out of time. <laughs> when was the last time Newcastle got past the fourth round of the FA Cup? Newcastle, it's your question. 2006. Oh, great bit of trivia. That is correct. That's a really good answer. They actually just closely got beat off Chelsea in the quarter-final. By what scoreline did Hull beat Sunderland in last season's quarter-final? Sunderland, this is your question. 3-0. 3-0 is the correct answer. Well done. Now to the final question. This is worth two points and both teams get a chance to answer. To the nearest thousand, what was the attendance of last season's FA Cup final? I'm going to start off this week. Sunderland. Can we confer? You can confer if you'd like time to confer, both teams. What was the attendance of last season's FA Cup final okay. to the nearest thousand? Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Both teams, right, we're ready. We're going to take Sunderland's yep. first answer. We're going to go with 87,000. 87,000. Over to Newcastle now. What is your answer? We were going to go 88,000. Whoa. One over or one under. <sighs> the correct attendance exactly was 80. 9,345. Oh. So, Newcastle, you get the two points. That's it for the quiz. We're going to have to top the scores up now. Just getting them through now. And for a third week in a row, Newcastle take it. They take it 7 4. Well done, guys. Thank you. So, looking forward, Sunderland and Newcastle, to the derby, which is in a couple of weeks' time. What predictions do we have? Jack, we're going to start with you. What predictions do we have for I you? reckon it's going to be a one-all draw. 
very conservative there. We have Sunderland correspondent over here. I'll plump for a 2 1 Sunderland win. For a 2 1 Sunderland win? Uh, 3 0 Sunderland. 3 0 oh. Sunderland? Yeah. And Sean McCormick. <laughs> uh, Avenue Newcastle fan? I think it'll be close. I think we're due a win. 2 1. Jack Colbert, late win out of the Gallagher. <laughs> oh, well. And as for me, completely impartial as we are here at the press box. Sunderland 12, Newcastle 1. Not the day, you can tell where my jurisdiction lies. <laughs> but that's it for the press box again today, and unfortunately we're not going to be here over the Christmas period, so we won't be back till New Year, when we will have all our January transfer specials, as well as the look back over the busy Christmas and New Year period for our clubs. So from all of us here at the press box, have a great Christmas. Goodbye. <laughs>